Hello, and welcome to our IRA seminar series. I'm Michael Kopp. It is my great honor to introduce today's speaker to you, Dr. Alexander Kornberg. Alexander is a leading patent lawyer who, according to the IM1000, and here I quote, specializes in implementing truly transformative patent strategies across a range of fields from artificial intelligence to cloud services. He is a partner at Kilburn and Strobe in London, and his clients regularly highly recommend him in such publications as Chambers and Partners and the MIP Handbook. That, in the patent world, I am told, is very impressive. What is more impressive maybe for the audience at hand is the fact that Alexander started life as what would now be considered to be deep learning royalty. He completed his PhD in the Gatsby unit, and his supervisor was Subin Garamani until recently the head of Uber Research. Alexander also worked um, and published with Jeff Hinton. There are few who've had as close a ringside seat as Alexander when it comes to how AI has affected the patent world, and even fewer who've actively shaped that process. I'd now like to yield the floor to Alexander. Michael, thank you very much. Um, you made me blush. Um, I'm such a modest soul. But um, thank you, everybody, for um, being here today to um, hear me talk about patenting and AI. Welcome, everybody. Um, okay, so what are we going to um, cover today? So I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of the AI patent landscape, what things are looking like at the moment as patent filings, a bit of history. Um, we'll talk about more generally, and that will be quite a big section, about patents and their users. And in the end, we'll apply all of this to AI and hopefully finish up with a bit of discussion. A bit of an overview, um, this uh, graph shows you um, patent filings in various um, areas of what you might call artificial intelligence. And you can see that the clear winner in filings here is machine learning. If we think today about AI and people um, say AI, I think usually what most people will mean is machine learning and the two terms seem to be used largely synonymously by many people. I think that's, you know, we'll be talking about AI here, but I think most of what we're saying applies to particular to machine learning and deep learning and the rise in these technologies in the recent years, as indeed has been shown by the interest in patent filings that has increased nearly exponentially over the years. And you might wonder then, you know, what are definitions of AI and machine learning, all these terms, and as um, patent attorneys, we of course care deeply on these definitions. And so I went on the web a little while ago and I was looking up um, definitions for AI. And I had a bit of a surprise in that um, this is the first thing that I found. Apparently, AI is a main sloth that lives only in Brazil. But um, joking aside, I think when we talk about AI here, we will mainly mean machine learning. So let's move on and let's sort of think about within machine learning what has happened over the last few years in different um, te technologies. And um, what kind of came as a bit of a surprise to me when I looked at it is that the, the clear winner here in terms of the um, increase in filings, uh, filings in recent years has been transportation and telecommunications. And, um, I've noted the um, transportation data sets that are part of the competition that this institute runs. So, so that is very timely. So looking a bit further at it, you can see that maybe unsurprisingly autonomous vehicles um, win, which if you think about all the um, learning tasks that need to go on these vehicles, it's not so surprising, but also transportation and traffic engineering and mapping is, is there really clearly as a high priority of patent filings. So we could talk at length about the various different fields um, that people file in, but that would probably not be fruitful. So we'll be moving on. And just to um, give you some more ideas of what's going on in this area of patenting, um, the top filers are IBM, Microsoft, and Toshiba. Maybe, maybe not that surprising, at least the top two of these. Um, what is interesting is that the biggest university filer of AI patents is the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And that came as a surprise to me. The top filing countries where patents are filed are US, China, and Japan. But what, it, what is interesting is that Europe isn't actually in part of the countries where most AI patents are filed. 
but it is um, part of the countries of the top three where those patents are then actually used and enforced in court. So clearly showing that Europe next to the US is a very important place to think about patenting artificial intelligence. Okay, so that's just a bit of background as to what's going on in this area. So I probably might be preaching to the converted here for a large number of you, and in which case I do apologize, but I thought it might be worthwhile just to create a baseline and talk just really briefly about what are patents. So patents are granted for inventions that are new and not obvious. Um, it protects how things or processes work. And um, what do we mean by new and not obvious? New is pretty clear. Not obvious is really meaning it's not lying in the road. It's not completely, um, you will not stumble upon it just by trying to pursue your normal goals. So um, coming from the Latin obvia, not obvious, not lying in the road. And um, so there's a bit of a threshold above just you have to do something new, you have to do something a bit more than you to justify getting a patent, because what a patent then does, it allows you to stop others from using the invention that you're patenting. And so to justify that, you just need to do something more than trivially new. So, um, right. So, what are patents for? And I think this will help us to understand. The, uh, the philosophy behind patents and the reasons for why people might get patents for. So there are a number of um, approaches to this question, philosophical and economic justifications for patents. So a more philosophical point is that a patent should protect the inventor's contribution to human knowledge. So there's some sort of idea that the inventor has contributed his property and that needs to be protected. It's a very sort of US-centric view. It's actually enshrined in the US contribution that basically um, the innovation of everybody needs to be protected. But then over here on the continent in Europe, we have a bit more of a um, economic view of things. And the idea is that patent should encourage investment in R&D by protecting the investment that people make in research and development. But also um, they're there to disseminate technical information to the public because patent applications include this information, they will get published and therefore the idea is, on the one hand, you encourage investment. On the other hand, you um, bring out the information into the public. So you could say the deal here is something along the line. You get offered as the inventor, as a potential reward, a time-limited monopoly to stop others from using your invention. And the state will help you doing that. And um, in return for that, you have to disseminate the information to the public. So once your patent has expired after the 20 year term of the patent everybody is free to use this information or alternatively if you never get a patent you've also given your information away free to the public and that will inform some of the things we're thinking about whether you should should not patent. so let's think then for a moment about why should you patent on the one hand it creates a tradable asset to capture value of the value of, in, of innovation. So um, it's all fair and well to develop a new technology and you can capture its value, hopefully by the value it adds to the product you're putting in the market. But on the other hand, it is quite abstract. And a patent allows you something to create a property right that you can try and transfer on the basis of it. You can use a patent on the other hand to secure competitive advantage of your innovation by excluding others from using it for a limited time. So why should you do it? Another reason might be that others might and can then stop you from using your innovation if indeed that's what's happened. So if there's a race to the patent office between people working on the same thing, it might mean that if you don't patent, somebody else might and you will lose out. So what are other reasons to patent you? of the innovation and that is independent of commercialization so the usual model is that people want to patent to either exclude others from your market or to license and um, generate money that way but actually all the patent as such does it allows you to stop other people from doing something so um, it allows you to control the use of your innovation and you can do that in the framework of open innovations where patenting makes it clear who owns ideas and allows um, parties to collaborate more freely as a result Another reason is that if you actually are attacked by another patent holder, you can use your own 
Whereas if you have technology they want and they have technology you need, then this may be a way out of potential um, litigation situation. And so patents, if used right, can create you a space to operate in by allowing you to have some more bargaining power than you would otherwise have. And finally, it allows inventors to publish because without patents, the only way you have to um, keep something and protect something and stop others from using it is to keep it secret, which goes against the idea that um, you want to publish. And so by creating this additional protection, you can then enable your inventors to publish. So that's all great. Everybody therefore should only file patents and do nothing else. Wonderful. And we'll be in business. No, there's, it's a more balanced picture than that. So why not to patent? A patent only gives you the right to stop others from using what you're doing. If you can't tell if somebody else is using it, you could argue that it will be useless to have a patent for a technology you can't detect if others are using them and therefore cannot stop them from benefiting from it. And that's particularly relevant in our area where a lot of things happen on the cloud or even if it happens in physical devices and reverse engineering is difficult, requires large capital investment in tapping chips and, and similar things. So um, if it's difficult to actually find somebody who uses your invention, you could argue what's the point of protecting it in the first place. Also, in order to get a patent, and you'll remember this is the other side of the deal, you will need to disclose the innovation and thereby give it away. And that is um, whether you get a patent in the end or not, you have to make it public. And that could be a disincentive to, publicing, uh, to patenting as well. So because patents are publications in the end, and that is part of the fundamental concept of patenting, trade secrets can in some circumstances be more powerful. So um, if you think about it, the patent makes you publish your innovation in return for a limited monopoly. But on the other hand, a secret invention can last forever. You can stop anybody else from using your invention forever as long as you can keep it secret. Of course, the difficulty with that is that that's not always straightforward. Even if you can keep things secret in the cloud and some of the things, it may not be possible because people are moving and information generally like entropy tries to spread out. And finally, even if you keep things secret and others have to do the work themselves to get there, they can do so, and there's a risk that others will develop your technology independently, patenting themselves. So what are the reasons not to patent? Briefly, patent, getting patents, unfortunately, is expensive. Maintaining them once you've got them is expensive. It can be a slow process, and um, there are demands on inventors' time. So it's um, important that all these factors are weighed up and, and you develop a strategy together with your advisors to decide the patenting is for you or is not for you. I hope I didn't bore you too much with this general part of the talk to give you some background on patenting, patent strategy, and the do's and don'ts and whys of patenting. So let's now look at patenting AI specifically and some question around that. A question you might want to ask, can you patent AI or an algorithm? So there has been more several years ago, but still now a, a big question mark. In a, public conception that software and algorithms can't be patented. And so we'll talk about this. Peak preview, um, you, know, you can patent um, algorithms. If you can patent algorithms, what is it? You can patent about them. And finally, we'll above apply the strategy ideas we've talked about just now to see how that all sits with patenting an AI, whether that might be a good idea or not, or in what circumstances that might be so. Let's think about the patentability of AI. Can you get patents for artificial intelligence. And the um, criteria here is pretty much the same as for any other software or algorithm. If your innovation is purely mathematical and abstract, then you'll be hard pressed to get patent protection for that. On the other hand, if there's an application, something in a technical realm where your algorithm, your um, machine learning technique makes a real contribution to the real world, if you like, to something technical, then that application is definitely patentable and is routinely patented. So examples here might be using machine learning in process control, using machine learning in analyzing medical data, using machine learning in, say, route planning, in all of these fields where um, a technical contribution, an engineering contribution is made by the machine learning, patents can be obtained. 
there's also another area where patterns can be obtained, and that is where the machine learning is specifically the algorithm, although general and not limited to a specific application, is specifically adapted for a hardware on which it can run. So for example, concepts here where specific ways of sharing different processes between um, CPUs and GPUs in certain ways that have technical benefits could, for example, be patentable, or doing certain operations that occur frequently in neural networks on special hard, specialized hardware in ways that um, allow the hardware to operate more efficiently is another example of where this leg of the patentability could work for you. So it is basically where you have done something specific in your algorithm that exploits the hardware, the governance on which the algorithm runs to make it work better. So there, these are the scenarios in which patenting machine learning techniques are really, I would say, uncontroversial and, and happen routinely. When you are trying to um, create a very broad concept, say, you know, several years ago, we would have wanted to patent back propagation as such as a technique of updating weights in a neural network that would, we would struggle with that today. But in the context of a specific application or adaptation for a specific hardware, such ideas could then be patented. So this is, this is the first question as to can you patent artificial intelligence as such? And the next question is, well, okay, so now we have a technical application. It is something that we can in principle patent, but are we new enough? Is there enough here to patent? So a lot of um, work in machine learning these days is going on about using a, use of relatively standard toolboxes to solve problems in, in doing inference in data. And it's really all about the data. There's nothing that new about the machine learning you're using. Obviously, it always takes a lot of experimentation and tweaking of parameters and playing around with things usually to get things to really work well. But um, if you're using standard toolboxes in a straightforward way, like you would in a routine manner, then it's unlikely that um, inventions will arise from that. So in terms of what we said before, of obviousness being something lying in the street, if your toolbox is just lying there in the street and you stumble on it and use it, you're unlikely to get a patent. But if you're doing something more, there's something a little bit counterintuitive or um, some development of technology that goes beyond what's known is needed, then those things are definitely over patentable and the, the hurdle to get over isn't all that high. Now, another question that it raises is whether that hurdle will get bigger in the future for many things if we think that we use more and more artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to discover correlations in data, to uncover new drugs, drug repurposing, and, and, and so forth. There is a concept here in patent law about whether something is obvious to try and it's basically just routine to do it. And if one day these techniques do just become routine, then there's a question whether a whole lot more will be obvious in many other fields that might be impacted by this technology than there are now, because um, we're just getting so much better at using data to make conclusions using machine learning techniques. I think we're not there yet. The law hasn't developed in that direction, but it does, that is definitely something to watch out for. And I'm sure something that lawyers will have a field day arguing about in court in the not too distant future. So you can patent artificial intelligence or um, things derived using artificial intelligence. And so the question is, should you or should you not? What are the um, specific considerations you have in relation to artificial intelligence that you need to think about? So the first one is with many machine learning applications nowadays, they tend to run in the clouds on servers that you can keep away from the public. And therefore, there's great potential for keeping your innovation actually secret. So what we've seen before is that if you can keep something secret, that can be a very, very powerful tool for commercial protection. And um, so this is always something that you want to weigh up whether actually the benefit you might get from patenting AI um, outweighs the fact that you actually have to make something public um, in, in the process. However, what I found from, from many of my clients is that actually it is very difficult to hire engineers, it seems, if you don't let them publish. It's a, still a very kind of academic field in, even in industry. And if you prohibit people from publishing, that can be quite hard. So um, therefore, maybe in those instances, being able to keep things secret is not that useful because you may in theory be able to do so, but you will not, nobody will agree to do the work for you if they can't publish it. And um, 
patents are exactly the sort of thing that allows you to get protection in and then publish freely once you have filed a patent application. Another um, important point is that AI in innovation may be actually difficult to pin down. So people talk about um, black box AI, and I think that is not true. It's not really a black box. Um, everything is usually deterministic in most um, systems that people look at, but it is very complex and often it's very hard to understand, it can be very hard to stand, understand what component of a system and um, setting of parameters that you tweak give you a benefit. And so um, in many situations, it might be quite difficult to create, require quite a lot of work and thinking to decide what actually um, is the innovation, what actually is the thing you're trying to protect is a patent and that's not a, such a reason to stop you from patenting but it makes it harder and it might increase the cost because it would it might require more involvement from professional advisors and more work and then finally really develop something fundamental and broad maybe like back propagations many many years ago it can be quite difficult to get protection that actually is commensurate with such a big theoretical contribution because we're limited to um, certain fields of application or certain hardware implementations. And so that's kind of another hurdle we have to grapple with at the moment because machine learning still is treated as something abstract rather than as a technology and field of engineering, like I personally think it, it should. So more consideration, and should you patent AI or not? So I think in many cases, a significant portion of the value of what you're doing in machine learning lies in your data set how you collected it, how it's been arranged, manipulated, cleaned. And if you have, um, if you can have unique access, access to the data set you're using for your work, that in itself might be very powerful protection and may make the case for patent protection less strong. So that's something that we should always bear in mind. On the other hand, as we said before, engineers do like to publish. So it depends. There are many of these factors. And what you need in the end is to develop a commercial strategy that factors all of these together and sets you in a path to the right approach for you. So that is um, the main part of the talk about patenting and whether you may want to consider patenting artificial intelligence or not. There's another interesting and hot topic at the moment, of which I'm sure many of you may have heard, which is that an, an academic at Surrey University has filed a number of patent applications for some concepts, including a fractal cup, for example, and certain pattern of blinking lights, which um, are purported to have been invented by a machine, by an algorithm called Dabas, which um, the developer of this algorithm actually attributes some sort of sentience to, and so it is, it is quite interesting to follow this story. But maybe most relevant to patent law for us in this is that the machine was named as an inventor on these applications in the US and Europe and the UK. All three patent offices may be unsurprised and say, no, you can't do that. The um, inventor has to be a person. So all of these patent applications fail, which I guess in a way may not be that big a problem because they're filed as test cases to answer just that question in the first place. Um, but the interesting question that this raises and for which I would be really interested to get some input from such an esteemed academic um, audience is whether machines can actually invent yet and, and, and what this means. I mean, my personal view is, is that while we have very powerful machine learning tools that help us to uncover inventions for the time being, and probably for the foreseeable, there is a requirement for a human to be involved to formulate the problem and interpret the results that machine learning gives. So I think for the foreseeable future, actually this question is not that pertinent, but it may one day become pertinent when actually machine learning advances to the stage where maybe concepts are developed independently of humans. So that is um, really an open question and one on which it'd be really interesting to, to get some views. This draws us to the end of um, the talk quite quickly, but and I really wanted us to leave a lot of time for discussion and questions and not to be rushed on this. But before we get there, if you take away one thing from this talk, I think that would be the following. That patents are tools to achieve your commercial aims. And this applies to AI as to any other technology. But I think in AI, there are some particular considerations 
about the ease of keeping things secret in cloud computing, about the fast pace at which technology moves so that in many cases you can get a patent for a technology, but by the time you do so, it will be out of date. And um, in any case, the central importance of the data and the value in that, that might make the need to get patent protection less pertinent. So all of these factors need to be weighed up and considered when you think about patenting AI. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. That was uh, fascinating. We have a few questions. I think the first one I can see in our chat, you may have already answered. Uh, I think that was in reference to the AI being named as a patent inventor. So a uh, side question, so who, who would it then belong to, the Dabus output? Would then the person who actually um, programmed Dabus have a, have a claim on, on, that, on that patent? Could that have been modified in the filing or what, what would be the outcome be on, on something like that? So that, at the, and the way things stand, the, the, um, the patent would belong to the inventor in the first place and then anybody the inventor assigns to or the inventor's employer. I think the trick here is that I think at the moment you can always still identify a human inventor because it is not the case that you just you know take as far as I know at least and I may be behind the curve on this but and I very happy that it would be fascinating to be said right in it but as far as I understand you know, do not just set off a machine learning algorithm on the body of knowledge of humankind and come up with useful output which then you might say okay well maybe there's some invention going on here by the machine learner I think at the moment the state of the art is such that there's always a direction, a question to be asked, an interpretation of results that will be will involve human input and human direction. And in that case, it is just a situation like any other where the human person is the inventor and therefore the owner or whoever gets the rights from the inventor. Now, in case of Dabbers, I think the question is we have to establish is whether really and truly Dabbers is the inventor and the originator of the inventive concept in each of these questions. And I don't think that there has actually been such a factual inquiry as to whether this is the case. And then if, mm -hmm. if this was not a test, test case about um, insisting that it is Dabos who invented and therefore Dabos should own it, then that would be a factual inquiry that would take place. If it really turned out that Dabos really is the inventor and there is no other inventor, I think then there would, there would be a problem and nobody would own the invention. It would be like an orphan invention as things presently stand because a machine cannot own property, a machine is not um, a person in the sense of patent law who would be capable of making an invention. So it would just be basically, yeah, an orphan invention, just free knowledge that nobody owns at the moment. So clearly this, if, if machines are developed that are, can truly be inventors, and that is actually the case, either it's already the case, and that was is such a fortunate machine, or it is not, and maybe it will be in the future, then there, there is a problem there in that you know, investment made into coming up with inventions using these machines, but at the moment, not. Very nice. Fascinating. I have another question, and it says, I just want to ask how the challenges to patent AI vary from country to country, especially EP versus US, and how has this changed over the last five to 10 years? Okay, very good question. If you look five to 10 years back, then um, around this time back, OJ, it's probably a bit longer than five years now, the US was traditionally much more liberal in allowing patenting of software. So in Europe, things haven't changed that much over that time. It's been fairly stable. We have this requirement for there to be something technically concrete, a technical contribution. It's called sometimes that um, the algorithm makes, it has to sort of interact with the technology around it in a way that produces a real world result. And that can make, give you, constitute a contribution that allows you to patent. Um, in the US, that was not the case for a long time and um, since basically the late 80s and it was a sort of bit of a free fall in terms of software patents compared to Europe. That all changed drastically with a decision um, called Alice in which um, the Supreme Court clamped down really heavily on patenting software and all of a sudden nobody knew anymore what you can patent in software in the US and then for a while it looked like you can get away with more in Europe than you can in the US because just every, every single thing got refused for a place now it's because it was all of a sudden this new standard. And it seems now that there is some sort of conversion where the US and Europe end up looking more and more similar. There are some sort of subtle differences. In particular, in, in, in AI, there's a very interesting one. Um, actually, a couple of areas where um, 
the US Patent Office and the EPO vary and the US Patent Office is in theory at least more favorable, which is that on the one hand, a classifier, a classification is actually seen as something technical in the US. So you can get a claim to a better classifier if you like, whereas in Europe, you would need an application of that better classifier because classification as such is seen as something abstract by the, uh, in the European case. So that's one difference where the US is more favorable. Another one is that the any, anything around um, uh, language processing is seen not very favorably at the at the um, mm -hmm. European Patent Office. And all NLP, natural language processing um, innovation, is is very hard to patent in in Europe. And it's about processing and the content of text, whereas that's something that's fairly uncontroversial in the US. So those are sort of two areas where you have an advantage in the US over Europe in terms of what you can get. But I think broadly speaking, it is very, very similar. And it's been sort of a conversion for the US, you know, doing more and more what Europe does. That's sort of, it was, it, sort of you could summarize, it was a free for all. It was very liberal. <laughs> then there was this big shock to the system and everything clamped down. And then they were sort of finding their way as to actually how to do it sensibly. And it sort of arrived at the standard that's been developed in the last 20 years. Very good, very nice. I, I remember those lofty rebuild ski years <laughs> before Alice. Um, I've got a question here, uh, someone asking, what do you think is the ratio roughly in your experience between AI hardware patents or specialized on chips and maybe software AI software patents or proprietary software packages? I think it's um, much more patent application activity in the software area than in the sort of specific, the, the sort of the hardware related you know, adaptation of algorithms to work better on specific hardware. Anyway, so it's definitely, definitely the latter of all so software applications. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you expect that to change? Mm, probably not, no. I think it's, it's just, um, it's probably just only so much you can do on developing hardware. It's a very useful, but fairly defined field, whereas the application for machine learning and AI seem to be more or less limitless. I have a question here, which goes back, I believe, to the case we discussed earlier of a, a machine inventing, so Davos and, and all this. What about if a person is, interpret, is interpreting the result to be the inventor? Could that be a way one could sort of say, well, the machine came up with it, but I actually recognized that um, this could have some value, so I interpret it. And hence, I guess it's me, <laughs> the inventor, or would that also be invalidated? And, you know, in in patent law is no other than any other error. That, that would certainly be an argument. Um, and I think it's not in a, in a perfectly valid argument. I mean, you know, when does an invention become an invention? The sort of legal test is, you know, who has contributed to the conception of the invention? You know, and there's a maybe a bit of a philosophical question, but one that may well be asked in the courts in the future that, you know, if, if there is some sort of correlation, say, between certain things that's uncovered by machine learning, but it takes a human to realize that it's important. What is the conception of the invention? The in information just lying there without any realization that you might want to use it, or actually using that information and realizing that it is useful. Mm -hmm. And based on what I know about how inventorship works and how cases like this have gone in some other areas about of patent law, where it is about um, second uses of known things and and, and and similar areas, I would guess that realizing that the information is valuable would be the conception of the invention. But it is it is a bit of an open question. Very nice. I have a question here that says, hi, given that AI is slated to be big and with so much uncertainty over patentability of AI inventions, is the AI technology a lost ground for companies to get patents in? If not, which aspects of AI do you see as being patentable? I don't think there is more uncertainty in this area. Yeah. In, in any other patenting of software. And I think the uncertainty is um, is not that, that big. And in most places, you can sort of fairly accurately predict what will happen. Certainly, that's the case in Europe and increasingly in the US as well. And everything is converging. So I don't think that there is such a huge amount of uncertainty around this. I mean, there's some uncertainty and there, there will always be some areas where you're pushing the boundaries of you can, you know, you can comfortably patent. But I think in many, many areas where you use machine learning and AI in a technical application or, you know, or uh, adapt it to work better on certain hardware, it is very clear that, you know, it is entirely patentable subject to the normal 
requirements of patentability that you have developed something that is new and inventive. I think that was a very long-winded introduction to an answer to the question, which I think is, no, I don't think it's a, it's a lost round of, of, of patenting or protecting innovation. I think as with any new technology, there is some sort of, there's an amount of uncertainty um, as to what can be patented and what can't be, and that's been the case in, um, in, in biology and biotech as well, and that's, that's not, nothing unusual, but I don't think there is sort of a lost generation of technology here. Good to know, very good. Um, someone says, impressive graph really patent areas over time. I know there seems to be a bump of machine learning patents in the late 1980s. Any idea what kind of patents were that? Or does it simply reflect the availability of higher compute power memory over um, at that time? Interesting, let me go back to this to this graph. Um, somebody has clearly an, an eagle eye for looking at yes. this. I, I, should, I should not be surprised. So I think that the little bump here is probably in the late 90s mm -hmm. um, or mid 90s more. Or late 80, yeah, uh, 91, yeah. Yeah, so. now yeah, then I 91, 92, yeah, I think 91 is sort of where this, I don't know. Anyway, around there in the 90s, um, I, d I don't know. I mean, um, I know that having worked in this area in the late nine, mid to late 90s, the commercial application of what we're doing in machine learning were pretty, pretty limited. And it was all, it's still a very sort of theoretical and academic endeavor. So you do see a sort of small increase. It sort of, it starts happening, but it's nothing like the takeoff that happens, you know, once um, sort of in, in 2000, the, 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 the mid noughties and um, so I can't tell you really the reason for that you know you could say around that time Jeff Hinton moved to London which is a fact <laughs> but I doubt that that's had anything to do with it um, right. but what, what I can say is very confidently that the sort of like the takeoff you see after the mid noughties is in my mind very clearly to do with the um, advent of using GPUs for compute for carrying out machine learning computations and <laughs> the corresponding sort of ability to actually do useful things with machine learning in finite time all of a sudden. And that sort of made people wake up to the potential of this technology in the real world. So I think that that shape of the graph after the mid noughties is, is, comes as no surprise to me. Interesting question about why it started taking off in the 1990s, but I um, don't have a good answer to that. Um, the same very observant person uh, also said, well, thank you for pointing out the challenge of identifying if someone else is infringing on your patent. Are there any cases where someone was caught infringing on an AI patent secretly? If yes, how were they caught? <laughs> um, That's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that, given that most of patents in this area are sort of fairly young. But I can tell you it's, not, it's no different from other areas of um, software that run in the cloud. And um, yeah, how would you find out? You would look at, in, in the usual way, you would have to look at, you know, input and output, see how things behave. You'd have to sort of come up with a reasonable suspicion as to why somebody is using your technology. And if you do have that, you can actually then get discovery and force people to disclose stuff if you can sort of substantiate why you think they're using your invention. So it's not quite as hopeless as it might sound at first. And very interestingly, actually, one of my clients actually is very relaxed about this because what they've noticed is that everybody basically publishes what they're doing. So you never mind that you can't find out what they're actually doing because they will tell you <laughs> in, 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 in MIPS or some other publication. And um, you just need to monitor the scientific journal to find out what, um, what companies are doing. So I'm not sure that's completely true, but um, certainly that's, um, th th there must be something to it because I can tell you this particular company I have in mind, they know what they're doing, so. Okay, <laughs> well, good to know. Um, another question here, how about patent alliances and patent pools? Have they started to become strategically meaningful in the field of AI? I'm not aware of any in the field of AI. So um, I think the answer to that has to be no at the moment. So all of it, there is, um, there's a lot of activity of this kind going on in um, video coding, in um, TV and um, in telecoms, but I'm not aware that there is sort of machine learning patent pools yet. Is one thing might be that might be sort of a timing effect and effect of the maturity of the technology. Um, also, the fact that there isn't really any kind of standard setting yet that 
gives you sort of wide um, applicability of certain techniques as there is in, say, video coding or in telecoms. And also another reason might be that machine learning isn't really a sector as such, I would say. It's a technology that you know, yeah. may find application in many different sectors. And so I'm sure machine learning patterns will find their ways into um, standards in telecoms and other areas where they're being used, whether there'll be a separate sort of sector of machine learning in the future really as a technology sector rather than an enabling technology that's used in many other sectors. I'm not so sure, but time will tell, I guess. Very nice. Very nice. I've, I've got a question on uh, discoverability. So I like the idea that you, you go and discover, but that depends on the jurisdiction, right? I mean, famously, Germany doesn't allow that. <laughs> so, so even in Germany, you can get a limited amount of, um, of discovery or investigations, as they call it, if you have sufficient substantiation that you, know, you suspect something is going on. There isn't sort of the routine discovery of or exchange of facts as there is in um, common law jurisdictions like in the UK or even more so in the US. But um, part of the beauty of having different systems of law in different countries is that you can use, these different, use um, hopefully use information you gain from um, litigation in the UK. And there will obviously be limitations on that, but at least you can develop some good idea of what's going on from jurisdictions where you can have discovery that might inform you in other jurisdictions. Very nice, very good. A very applied question. So what steps would you recommend researchers, academics, and so on to take in order to successfully patent their inventions? Contact you? <laughs> um, well, contact me or your, um, your, as a, your usual professional. I think there are steps before that that are really crucial. I think uh, there's a sort of a two-part answer, and one of them goes really to, you know, there's sort of academics and individuals working there, and usually that will be in the context of some organization. So there's sort of the individual and there is the organization, you know, and what does the, what the ex individual needs to do, I think, is education and being mindful of, you know, the challenges and opportunities that patenting can represent, and therefore sort of thinking in a patent way when you develop things, you know, thinking about obstacles you've encountered and solutions you developed to that, therefore you have advanced the state of the art and there may be an invention here. In terms of, you know, maybe thinking more about what startups and you know, management, if you like, should do, I think having a system in place to encourage inventors or, you know, R&D staff to, to disclose to the company what they're doing and to think about it in these ways. So having um, a system in place of collecting that information, of encouraging it, of incentivizing it, maybe with money or in other ways. Um, those are sort of the, the crucial steps. And the one that comes before everything, though, is that if you're interested in patent, the one thing you must do is to answer the question as to whether patent protection may or may not be interesting in a certain area of what you're doing before you publish. And I think that is that is really step zero that you make sure you have asked the question and and answer it at least, you know, no, before you start publishing. And if you answer it yes, you make sure that you get protected before you publish. Because once you have published, then it's too late. Very nice. I have a more, a, a bit of a curveball. <laughs> if, yeah, I, I if I view, if I view um, you know, and I like how you said most of AI is actually machine learning. If I look at most of the AI models, essentially the data is the fuel the, the 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 model is essentially extracting from the fuel patterns mm -hmm. correlations and, and you mentioned that if I were sitting on a unique data source, it wouldn't it in wouldn't it be for me more advantageous to somehow limit the use of the data for uh, of the data source and the insights I allow people to to have via licensing agreements and then in a way the patent is nice but actually maybe I don't even need that if I view the models or the machine learning models is essentially value extractors of the data. Absolutely. That is definitely the case. And I think AI is sort of one of these areas where there are many other ways that may mean of, of protecting your investments that may mean that you don't need to patent or it might actually be disadvantageous to patent. So it might be more interesting to keep things secret if you can. So that's what that's one thing. But also, as you said, that the data, if you can control access to the data, that's hugely valuable. Um, you know, and either by, you know, in terms of exclusion of being able to, to be the only entity that has access to this data, and therefore you are the only entity that can do this stuff, 
nobody else can because you just don't give away access or giving away access in a way that is controlled. And then it gets more tricky how you actually do control access to the data and um, stop others from using it without your authorization might be tricky, you know, because once you, depending on how you allow access to it. But yeah, definitely, if you can, if you can protect the data, that might well be your crown jewels in many areas where really the machine learning part of it is, you know, more, must be just involves, you know, clever application of more routine techniques now. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. As a follow-up question, I'm, uh, good that I sparked some debate, um, which goes, uh, how do you get models developed that actually work effectively on your data, particularly if you're not releasing it? I guess the background here is that it's actually probably the best way of, of knowing that uh, a, a network model works is if you benchmark it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be you have enough data and you can do that yourself. But in many cases, let's say, I come to you and I say, I have the best self-driving car or the best um, uh, autopilot for an airplane. I think um, people would probably want to see this tested on billions of flight miles under mm -hmm. extremely difficult circumstances before they would even yeah, credit any value to that pattern. Um, so do you think a model where you try and limit access to the data, but then do the AI free is something that works? Or how do you, how do you see that developing? I'm not sure that that would work if you mm -hmm. gave away, you know, if you wanted other people to try what you're doing, I think you would have to let them have access to the data. Yeah, yeah. no, no, that, that was the right. premise. So you would you'd give limited access to the data, you try and Fort Knox it, <laughs> and that might yeah. not be possible in terms of what people can do. But in the end, you might just say, okay, um, patenting the AI may or may actually be counterproductive if I can, if I need something that's benchmarked. But maybe following on from there, once a solution exists, let's have lots of patterns, how I productionize it and so on and so forth. I mean, the first thing I think, the first part of the answer is you do not have to have conclusive proof that something works in order mm -hmm. to patent it. Ah, what, okay. you, what you need to have is it has to be plausible. You know, you have to enable somebody to do what you say you're doing, and it has to be plausible that it's useful, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in many instances, you know, the innovation might be in sort of you know, putting two kinds of models together for a certain application and there sort of you can have an explanation as to why that's a good idea and it all seems quite logical. And that should be enough for you to get a patent on this. Whether it then turns out to be really useful and widely accepted is definitely something where you would need to, you know, let it out there and let people try it and validate it and all the rest of it. But if you do this once you have your patent application filed, it's of no detriment to the patent. Mm -hmm. And um, you will get your answer eventually. So as with many things, if you were to wait to file a patent to be certain something is useful, there would be very, very limited circumstances under which you can patent. Very nice. So it doesn't have to work. I, I, I will contact you about that warp drive idea <laughs> <laughs> very soon. No, very, very nice. I have no further questions. Are there any further questions from anyone? If not, then Alexander, first and foremost, thank you very much indeed for a fantastic talk. Um, really, really enlightening. So sorry, I asked so many questions myself. No, no, no. Is... You, say, you saved me. It would have been a very short talk otherwise. Ah, please. <laughs> With that, thank you very much to our speaker, Alexander, and thank you very much for everyone to participate. And uh, be safe, be well. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening.